Within the history of video games as a medium, the third-person shooter has become one of the main dominant forms of gameplay and aesthetics in the industry. The third-person shooter as a genre begins to take shape during the console generation of PlayStation, Sega Saturn, and Dreamcast. The original Tomb Raider, released in 1996, is one early title that stands out as popularizing the genre. This mix of Indiana Jones-inspired adventure and gunplay similar to action films like Hard Boiled was praised for its innovation in both gameplay and aesthetic approach. The camera is set in a third-person perspective, where Laura is always visible to the player. This created a new experience and engagement with puzzle-solving action-adventure shooter elements. A depiction of one of the main innovations in Tomb Raider was his player agency to equip and unequip Laura's weapons. This gameplay feature changed how she interacted with her environment to solve puzzles, traverse design landscapes, and engage with combat. In the mid-2000s, there is an important shift in the cultural hegemonic trend of third-person shooters. The release of Resident Evil 4 in 2005 reinvented and revitalized the third-person genre completely. This title popularized an action survival trend within the gameplay. Aesthetically, instead of a wide-angle approach with the character framed at center, like how you view Lara in Tomb Raider, Resident Evil 4 placed the camera over the shoulder of the character, Leon, which affords the player a more dynamic view of the action. An additional innovation that is instrumental to this dominant form of shooter was the introduction of the cover-based system. Games like Uncharted, Drake's Fortune, Mass Effect, and most importantly, Gears of War incorporated this tactical element. Levels were designed with environments that focused on chest-high walls so players could use them to get a tactical advantage on the enemy combatants. Titles like Gears of War also introduced a grittier, dark tone as the cover-based system became the hegemonic design choice for the third-person shooter genre. It's nearly impossible to discuss Max Payne 3 without first contextualizing it within the series. The first two installments of the Max Payne trilogy are critically acclaimed third-person shooters and incorporate similar gameplay techniques as the original Tomb Raider, like the camera center-focused on player character of Max Payne. Take place in cold, noir-inspired, almost post-apocalyptic streets of a fictionalized New York City. The story is told in a gritty graphic novel format that formulates a meta-level interaction with the character and the player themselves. I had no choice. I couldn't have waited for Mona. It was Vlad's excuse. Fate. I didn't trust myself. Max. I'd forgotten about the radio Mona had given me. Max. I'm here. Took a ride with the cleaners. I'll let you know when we get where we're going. Max. About what happened. Can't talk now. I couldn't crack her. I had to crack the case. This is illustrated through the embedded narrative in the narrative of Max Payne 2 that a player can watch on strategically placed in-game television sets. The short episodes explore a postmodern reflection of the game's actual narrative, which even stars Sam Lake, writer and developer of Remedy Games, who was even the character model for the original title.
From a strictly gameplay perspective, the most unique part of these two installments is the gameplay aspect of bullet time. This feature allows the players to slow down time like in action movies like The Matrix to avoid gunfire from enemy goons and give the player an advantage in overwhelming odds. Additionally, this unique element also engages with an effective experience of being an action hero as you fly through the air blasting away austere thugs in slow motion. Max Payne 3, published by Rockstar Games in 2012, initially shifts this original gameplay formula by implementing the cultural dominant gameplay mechanic of the third person shooter genre, the cover based system. On a technical level, the game itself incorporates the Euphoria physics engine to achieve an updated mechanical aesthetic depicting how bodies interact with the combat in movement. These physics are implemented within the overarching engine of the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, or RAGE. With these new and still culturally relevant technical components, Max Payne 3 formulates a similar atmosphere while serving as an illustration of Raymond Williams' conceptualization of the dominant, emergent, and residual culture through both gameplay mechanics and narrative identity. This adaptation of the hegemonic gameplay mechanic of the cover-based system goes beyond gameplay and reaches into formal aesthetic features and affect. Max Payne 3 embraces a grimy approach to the third-person shooter to serve as an oppositional force to titles like Gears of War, which embrace hegemonic core gameplay values and deliberately instills in a form of uneasiness and distorted effective element to the experience. This new conceptualization of gameplay fits Max's intricate and reflective experience in Brazil. Max Payne has aged since his last noir narrative, with the apt title, The Fall of Max Payne. The updated cover-based system mixed with Max's aging tactics drives the story and gameplay forward. The shooting has a real weight to it. It's clunky, awkward, and slow in a way, which reflects an older, more grizzled protagonist. This clunkiness also makes it more satisfying, landing accurate shots within the gunfire-addled environments. Visual feedback in the form of slow motion kill cam also emphasizes this weighty, effective experience. As Max shoots his way through bass-driven nightclubs and empty soccer stadiums, the game's aesthetics distort and fragment spaces the players destroyed. These almost haptic affects of satisfying, clunky gunplay fade away like the feeling of wasted adrenaline as the aesthetics fragment in Max's VO begins. I had a hole in my second favorite drinking arm, and the only way we were likely to get Fabiana back now was in installments. This illustrates the damage that this violent loss has caused Max as a character, while also leaving the player with a melancholic, discreet feeling and allowing them to reflect upon their violent actions. Like in the previous installments of the series, Max heals himself in both gameplay and narrative through an inoculation consisting of painkillers and whiskey. They may give Max more health in a gameplay sense, but actually serve as harmful upon Max's health in the long term. This is illustrated thematically through the weighty gameplay and visual distortions. Max's dangerous cocktail also connects to Roland Barth's conceptualization of inoculation, stating, one immunizes the contents of the collective imagination by means of small inoculation of acknowledged evil. One thus protects it against the risk of generalized subversion. Max ingests this form of inoculation as it dulls his senses to the evils he perceives throughout the game's narrative. 
Whether it be the endless lives of South Americans he takes with his violent rampage, all the while being betrayed by the bourgeoisie socialites he is paid to protect, or the black market organ harvesting operation funded by the paramilitary group that also has poisoned the authority of the Brazilian police force, or even something as petty as his disdain for electronic house music. Bottle of champagne, eh? This kind of place made me want to puke. I needed a real drink to deal with the electronic music and the robotic people. Much like the inclusion of visual feedback, Max Payne 3 revitalizes the bullet time mechanic. There are many cinematic set pieces that set up for engaging in chaotic experiences. This focus on a more cumbersome combat experience also serves as a metaphor for bullet time as what Raymond Williams defines as a residual part of culture. Williams states, the residual, by definition, has been effectively formed in the past, but it is still active in the cultural process, not only and often not as an element of the past, but as an effect element of the present. Thus, certain experiences, meanings, and values which cannot be expressed or substantially verified in terms of the dominant culture are nevertheless lived and practiced on the basis of residue. Gameplay aspects like the visual feedback and bullet time that echo back these early iterations of the third-person shooter reflect Williams' concept of the residual. There are gameplay formats that could not be expressed by a hegemonic AAA developer without relying on the aging character and intellectual property of Max Payne. The bullet time mechanic is the residue of gaming culture. The sticky ring left from Max's spilt whiskey tumbler. Throughout the narrative of Max Payne 3, the player character finds himself in a fragmented, postmodern, political, financial, and military catastrophe. Max is displaced into the unfamiliar environment of Brazil from the cold, dark streets of New York and New Jersey. Max Payne is tasked with working security, protecting a family of socialites from the poor for a rich Brazilian patriarch with ties to the political elite. Much like the gameplay component of Bullet Time, Max the character is a presence of the residual. He's an aging ex-cop who in his own words is, I'm a self-righteous pain in the ass, but I'm not above embezzling office supplies. His sense of American morality and his cold, stoic, noir-inspired worldview are tested in this disassociating environment. He's a man lost within a social and political structure of feeling, a theory also conceptualized by Williams, that the social sensibilities and feelings that make up everyday life are shaped by broader historical structures and political economic forces that in turn, Max cannot completely comprehend. So I guess I've become what they wanted me to be. A killer. Some rent -a clown with a gun who puts holes in other bad guys. Well, that's what they had paid for, so in the end, that's what they got. Say what you want about Americans, but we understand capitalism. You buy yourself a product and you get what you pay for. 
And these chumps had paid for some angry gringo without the sensibilities to know right from wrong. Here I was, about to execute this poor bastard like some dime store angel of death. And I realized they were correct. I wouldn't know right from wrong if one of them was helping the poor and the other was banging my sister. In addition to this American capitalist ideology, Max attempts to bring a Western film gunslinger as morality to this foreign space. This form of residual morality works for the dominant class he has been paid to protect, as Max puts his life at risk to save the bourgeoisie socialites through any means necessary. Also, this stubborn American morality, along with the inoculation of multiple substances, make him the perfect fall man for this complex plan to rig political elections in Sao Paulo. The game's narrative identifies and is self-aware of these explicit and implicit problematic ramifications of this sort of clash between cultures, and alienates Max as a character even more. That was the last of the explosives. I just hoped it was enough to bring down the building and all the evil in it. Fight, fight, copy the, copy the fight. Who wants to take a shot? You see what this is? Come on, anybody? Wanna be a hero? I got nothing to lose, let's do it. Que porra que tá acontecendo aqui? Senor Nevis. What the fuck is your problem, man? <laughs> My problem? My problem? Wanna know what my problem is? You're turning humans into glue! That's what my fucking problem is! I don't know what you're talking about, American! All I know is what I hear about you. You bodyguard for the Brancos. They are all dead! You help the poor. Today, many of them dead. You are a proper American hero. At least I fucking tried! Well done with your effort. The whole city is grateful. The great American savior of the poor. That's right. You think you made any difference? You think stopping this legitimate business venture is helping anyone? Legitimate? You're stealing people's organs. We pay for everything. We have the records. Oh, so people can sell their livers, their hearts, their eyeballs, you're insane, you sick fuck! We kept people safe in the city! Decent people! Safe! I know a lot of powerful people. Well, your powerful people are gonna help you out of this one, buddy. Max's distorted experience in Brazil thematically reflects Frederick Jameson's architectural metaphor for postmodernism, the Bonaventure Hotel. One aspect of Jameson's conceptualization is the hotel's glass skin that reflects its surroundings back on the person observing the building. This reflection of its surroundings disassociates the building from its environment and refracts its own interiority, making it impossible to peer inside. The Bonaventure's disassociative space and refractive glass skin can be seen as a reflection of the environment Max traverses through. These specifically designed spaces are an amalgamation of urban environments to keep the areas fresh for the player, but also are foreign, confusing spaces for Max as a character. Aesthetically, this is illustrated through the fragmenting and distorting of the cutscene cinematics in the gameplay as Max tries to understand the complex web of deceptions and corruptions his new employer has immersed him within. Finally, the level design serves as a greater example of the globalized hyper-capitalism that grasps the South American environments. As the rich party on the extravagant yachts, and the poor dwell and are terrorized in the favelas, Max Payne 3 portrays a total space ruled by fragmentation, disassociation, and the perpetuation of the wealth disparity created and sustained by global capitalism. 
The original IGN review of Max Payne 3 aptly describes this thematic crafting of narrative identity, illustrating, it touches on the disparity between rich and poor, and how resentment and desperation can fester in the slums and the penthouses alike. So this was it. My easy retirement money. My blood-stained 401k. A chance to drink for free while chaperoning socialites around town and making sure the poor people didn't get too close. The brochure sure didn't mention any of this shit. The customer restroom. I could get through to the departure gates up ahead. There were Ufe all over the airport and civilians were being moved out. Looking at it one way, shutting down the airport for their escape was a weird sort of compliment, but one I didn't need. Max is disassociated from the South American urban environment, out of time and out of place. To a great extent, this alienation and disassociation reveal Max as a subject of the neoliberal ideology of the self-enclosed individual. Julie Wilson, author of Neoliberalism, part of the Key Ideas in Media and Cultural Studies series, explains this concept as Forms of liberal individualism, including both possessive individualism and self-appreciating individualism, where the self is imagined to be radically cordoned off from others in its social world. Hard boundaries between self and others exist and encourage an oppositional consciousness, where people feel like it's them against the world. Self-enclosed individualism is thus fundamental to neoliberal culture and living in competition. This neoliberal ideology is represented through an effective moment of gameplay, as Max enters the final stretch of his violent spree in South America. The song Tears by the industrial noise rock band Health plays, revealing a meta moment where Max and the player are self-enclosed by the audiovisual aesthetics and entombed in a space away from oppositional consciousness and in a moment of us against the world. Throughout the game's narrative, Max Payne 3 incorporates optional interactable cutscenes where Max diegetically plays the otherwise non-diegetic main theme from the Max Payne 3 series on various pianos placed throughout the game's environments. The musical interludes serve as an illustration of the narrative identity of the meta-storytelling of these previous installments in the series. These contemplative moments reflect the player and the character's effective experiences within the oppositional clash of hegemonic gameplay and the grimy gaming culture of the past as affiliated with the Max Payne intellectual property. In a parallel of this oppositional clash, Max has lost his position of authority and interpolation within this contemporary narrative. He has become the interpolated residual subject of both hegemonic gaming design and the disassociating shift of ideology in a foreign environment. The act of becoming the subject, and by extension, being thrust beyond this contained world in medium of the noir graphic novel framing device, Max is illustrated even further as a form of the residual. Like Jameson's illustration of the Bonaventure Hotel, Max's own reflective surface is revealed through this noir-inspired inner monologues, refracting his environment through a lens of his distorted, melancholy, and substance-addled affective experience. Another dark, rainy night. Another police station. Another futile crusade for amends. Time moves forward. Nothing changes. As Max finally attunes his reprise within the hollow shell of a dilapidated Brazilian high-rise, 
Max, and the player experience a moment of harmony that mediates the oppositional forces of hegemonic gameplay design and the residual at work throughout this piece of interactive media. There it was, the soundtrack to my life. And, for a few seconds, came harmony. Finally.